Well, you can go ahead and have a seat. It's good to see you guys here today. My name is Robert, one of the pastors here. I'm excited to uh, be sharing with you guys today. If you are joining us from Parker, we're especially glad to have you joining us today as well. Uh, grateful to have you a part of the Calvary family. And uh, today as we get started, I've got a, a question for you. I want you to kind of think with me on a situation here. Um, have you ever noticed how often we want people to read our minds? Now, obviously, this is only when it's like advantageous or helpful for us. Like, we never want people to read our minds when it's going to incriminate us. But, but think about a situation here. Think about the last time you moved something like big and bulky or heavy, and really, you just wanted the person to read your mind, but it didn't happen. They went right when you were thinking left. They zigged when you zagged. They didn't pivot when you wanted them to necessarily. And... and it seems like the bigger and bulkier something is, the more you just really want someone to just automatically know what you're thinking and where you need to go and stuff like that. And I was reminded about this because this last week, my wife and I picked up a swing set and uh, we're getting it to, to bring over to our kids. But this wasn't like a Walmart swing set that you know we could just like pick up and put in a trailer or something. This was like the Costco swing set that was like playground level, like me and my three buddies could swing on it and it'd be totally fine. So the only way this is leaving the backyard it's in and making it to our backyard is to fully disassemble the thing. So. But to do that, it's all like nine, 10 feet up in the air. We have to tip this thing over. And so it's my wife and I and our kids, and our kids aren't necessarily helpful with stuff like this yet. So it's just me and my wife. And we ran into a little bit of an issue kind of getting going with that. And by issue, I mean, I was terrible at communicating. And it turns out that saying, we're going that way isn't actually very helpful because that way is not clear which way that is. So we figured it out, obviously, and it wasn't that big a deal, but it got me thinking about all the different areas of our life that, that we kind of just expect people to read our minds and we get disappointed when they don't. Think about the, the, the last time you got into an argument with your spouse, it probably was because one of you didn't just intuitively know what the other person was thinking. Maybe you expected your spouse to, to just understand what you were thinking, just get it, and it was probably the guy and they just didn't get it because we don't just get it. Or, or maybe it was with your kids and they just didn't live up to the expectations, they didn't read your mind what you were thinking and they let you down because they didn't meet that expectation that maybe you didn't even communicate to start with. Or, or most frustratingly, the last time you were aggravated at someone on the road because they didn't read your mind and go where you wanted them to go at the speed that you wanted them to go there. See, the, the truth is that we're, we're often frustrated because we expect people to just know what we're thinking, to think like us. Why can't they just get it, we might say. And see, I bring this up because I think there's a connection with our relationship with God in this as well, because the truth is that oftentimes God looks at our life and sadly, we have to admit that he's saddened and disappointed by the fact that we aren't living up to the expectations that we have. But unlike our interaction with each other, God has been very clear to communicate, to lay out those expectations, to show us here is what I want you to do. And he's been very clear to explain just how he wants us to think like his son, Jesus. And tonight, as we jump into Philippians chapter two, uh, we're gonna share a passage that I think gives us some really clear instructions on how God wants us to think like Jesus. And, and as we do that, the, the hope is that that thinking like Jesus turns into acting and living like Jesus and living more how God's designed us to live. So we're gonna read Philippians chapter two. If you don't have a Bible with you, we invite you to grab one of the Bibles out of the chairs around you like we do every week. If you're in Parker, you can go ahead and pop up right now and uh, there's some Bibles at the table at the back of the room. You can grab one of those and make use of that. I think it's page 1165 if you've got one of our Calvary Bibles. Philippians chapter two, starting in verse five, says this. It says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, 
being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That was a a great passage, probably a favorite for many of you, definitely a favorite from the book of Philippians here. And as we look at this, I think there's three big areas of our life. If we want to think like Jesus, three areas that Paul lays out for us here of 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 some things we need to be intentional in if we want to be more like Jesus. And the first is that we need to imitate Jesus' humility. We need to imitate Jesus' humility. When you look at this, it's very clear that the first big theme there is that Jesus lived with humility. And Paul really takes us through several steps, several stages of of the significance of that. He starts first with that statement that, that though Jesus was in the form of God, he said he didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, this is this is a huge statement. Like, honestly, we could camp out here all night, and some of you are like, uh-oh, are we going to? No, we're not. It's fine. We'll, we'll move on from this. But, but this is big, and I actually love how the NIV states this. The, the New International Version says, he did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Let that sink in for a second. The, the Son of God coming in human form here didn't count his equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. His his divine royalty, his positional authority, his honor and glory, all available to him, and yet he says, I'm not going to use that for my own advantage. It's an act of humility. That's an act of submission there. He continues and says, he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. His mindset wasn't one where he said, hey, everyone's going to come serve me and focus on me. His mindset was one of, hey, I'm here to serve others. I'm here to look for the needs of other people and how I can meet those. He goes on and says that 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 next stage of humility was demonstrating the fact that Jesus came in human form. Think about that, the downgrade of that for Jesus for a second. Like, there he is, right hand of God in heaven, there speaking all creation into existence with God the Father, watching all that, and then bam, baby Jesus in a manger in Bethlehem. Like, that's a downgrade. Like, it's a serious downgrade for him. And, and, and Philippians doesn't really take us much further than that, in that train of thought, but think about beyond just the fact that he's human form, think about the place and time in socioeconomic place that he's in. Like he wasn't born into like the king's household with all the, the, you know, all the fixings, the silver spoon, all that. Like he's born in a poor family in Bethlehem. He grows up in Nazareth, the place where they say, can anything good come from there? Like that's, that's our Baus or our Kingman. If, if you're online, you're watching from Baus or Kingman, we love you. Just don't really love your town that much. Um, but but that's, that's where Jesus says, hey, this is, this is God's plan. This is where I'm going. This is how I am submitting to the Father's plan and where I am putting myself in humility. He goes on and shares that, that uh, he literally humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross. And we'll get into that a little later. But it's just a continued indication there. And what he's wanting to extrapolate here is that humility wasn't just a momentary thing for Jesus. Jesus didn't choose for a moment to be humble and then go back to his normal self later. His, his entire existence here on earth from beginning to end was, was soaked in humility. And this is so important because humility is at the core of what God desires for us as his people to live with and operate by. And Jesus, as our example, had to lead with that and model that. And and see, when we look at humility, it has to start first with our relationship with God. We have to come to God with that understanding of, hey, I can't be proud or arrogant about who I am because that's, that's antithetical to faith. See, Ephesians chapter two reminds us that, that we've been saved by grace through faith. It says, this is not our, out of our works so that no one can boast. We didn't do this. 
We can't do anything to save ourselves. It's only Jesus that saves us. So it's that reminder that, hey, we have to come to God with that posture of humility saying, hey, God, you've done everything, and effectively, I've done nothing, so here I am. But then that humility also has to extend to our interaction with people as well. And see, I think humility is one of those difficult things to define and one of those, those kind of tension points because it, it so easily gets married to things that humility really isn't. And so we might use the opposite and say, hey, the opposite of humility is pride and arrogance and, and, and undue confidence. But if we're not careful, we can start to define humility by saying that humility is, you know, is thinking that you're, that you're worthless, thinking that you're insignificant, thinking that you're not valuable. And those are things that are all an improper definition of humility. See, if, if this feels a little redundant from last week, it's because that humility is soaked all throughout the Bible. And last week, Pastor Joe taught on this, and he shared uh, verse three of this passage, which says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. I wanna read a few more passages just to kind of share a, a, an overview of what the Bible says. Luke 14, 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Psalm 22, 4, the reward of humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Finally, Micah 6, 8, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. See, God doesn't desire for us to think less of ourselves, but that idea of humility is that we're looking at other people, we're looking at their needs, we're looking to, to put them as a priority. And several years ago, I heard this definition of humility by Rick Warren uh, out of The Purpose Driven Life, and he said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. That, that we're not lowering our value, lowering our worth, because God is, is continuing to say, you are, you are worth a, a ton. You are worth my son dying for you. But humility is saying, I'm going to think of myself less often and think of more other people more often than myself. So here's, here's some practical steps that I think we can take to, to foster humility in our life. First, this is kind of the, the overarching one, but first, prioritize other people's needs. And this is kind of the, the, the big picture one, I get that, it's not super specific, but prioritize other people's needs. Especially at home, your spouse, at work, if you are still working, you know, your coworkers, people in your life, your friends, do they have a need and can you rearrange your priorities, your schedule, your agenda to help meet that? So prioritize other people's needs. Second, be patient with other people. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the fact that impatience really comes from the fact that we think our schedule, our agenda, our to-do list is more important than the other people that we're impatient with. We think our time is more valuable than theirs, it's more important than theirs. So I want to challenge you, next time you're, you're feeling impatient, check yourself and ask, is, is my life, is my schedule really more important than this other person's? Because it's not. So be patient with people. Third, admit your weaknesses. See, we're programmed to, to cover up our weaknesses, to, to, to conceal those and hide those, but really all that does is build pride and arrogance in our life. But when we can be honest about our weaknesses, our failures, our shortcomings, it allows us to really model humility by saying, hey, this is who I am, and this is what God's doing in my life through that. So be open with your weaknesses. Along with that, be open to correction. Fourth idea there of, of modeling humility, be open to correction. We all love being corrected and rebuked, don't we? Like we're just like, hey, where do I sign up for someone to tell me how I did something wrong this week? But how we respond to those moments determines whether we're gonna live with pride or with humility. Because when we respond with pride, we're dismissive, we're argumentative, we're rude, we're corrective back. 
But humility says, hey, I'm going to listen, and maybe there's a, a small sliver of truth that I can glean from this. And even if there isn't, I'm going to respect the other person and listen. Finally, shine the spotlight on other people. We're so naturally good at wanting to take the spotlight on us of saying, hey, look what I've done. Look at this good deed I have done. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about just, oh, it's our culture right now that wants to take a selfie while we're doing some, like, you know, act of service, you know, that selfie, like, hey, I bought this homeless guy your lunch, and here's my selfie to show it. And I, I was thinking that this is just a, like, right now problem. And then God reminded me of Jesus' words in Matthew 6, verse 3. He says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret." your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, we can't obviously, like, keep our hands from knowing what the other one is doing, but it's that mindset of, like, we don't need to, to, to draw the spotlight on us for what we're doing, because God's going to see what we do. He's going to reward our faithfulness if we continue in that. So there's some practical steps that I think we can take to, to grow in our humility, to grow in thinking less of ourselves or thinking of ourselves less, rather. So first thing, imitate Jesus' humility. Secondly, we need to replicate Jesus' trust. See, as we go through this, it, it says that, that Jesus was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And, and that obedience was rooted in Jesus' unwavering trust. He trusted in God the Father above everything else. Think about just the, the course, the big picture of his lifespan. The plan for him to come and be born as a baby required trust. The plan for him to, to grow up working and providing for his household required trust. The plan for him to spend years teaching and traveling and, and, and instructing people, most of whom were not receptive and did not believe, required trust ramps up towards the end, the, the plan for him to be brutally beaten and tortured required trust in the Father's plan. The plan for Jesus to go on the cross and be crucified and die in that manner required trust. And even more so, Jesus bearing the weight and punishment and penalty of the sins of all of us, all of humanity in that moment required trust. And it's easy to think, well, he's the son of God. Of course, he trusts like God the Father. Of course, it's easy for him. And at some points, it probably was very easy. But when it got real, we see both the challenge and the trust demonstrated because the night before Jesus was arrested and beaten and crucified, it says that he was in the garden praying, and he's, he's praying before the Father and the words are recorded in Scripture. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. He's literally saying, if there's any other way, if we can come up with plan B or plan C, if we can come up with an alternative to accomplish this, please let's find another way. But the next breath, Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. See, when it got real, and that challenge to trust God's plan was, was right in front of him. He demonstrated continued trust, which resulted in his obedience. Now, I think this is important for us because I think it's super easy for us to come to God with our agenda, with our plan for life and, and what we're going to do and say, hey, God, can you just kind of rubber stamp this with some blessings and we just push this on through and everything's going to be great. I'm going to live happy and healthy and rich and everything's going to be comfortable and great. But the reality is God really doesn't want to just rubber stamp our plans for life. He wants us to say, hey, God, here's my plans for life. I'm dropping them at your feet. You tell me where to go and what to do now. I'm submitting my life to you and saying, okay, I'll go where you lead me from this point. So the question really comes back to, do we trust God? Do we trust God with, with our careers, with our, with our jobs? Do we trust that God's going to continue to provide for us, continue to, to give us opportunity and open doors? Do we trust that God will honor our decision to be honest and trustworthy in our work? Do we trust that 
operating our business or doing our job the way God has called us to will reward us in the end. Do you trust God with your kids, with their, their health, their safety, their future, their, their life decisions and life paths? See, the, the wonderful truth is that God loves your kids before you did, and he loves them more than you do. And so we can trust him in that with our kids. So do you trust him with your kids? Do you trust God with your relationships, with how you respond to difficulties, with how you respond to your friends? Do you trust God's instructions to bless and not curse those who hurt you? Do you trust God's plan for your marriage and how you're supposed to respond to your spouse? If you're single, do you trust God's timing and his plan in that area of your life? Do you trust God when life doesn't seem to be going the way you want it to be? When you're confused, when you're hurt, when you're broken, when you're beaten down, you think this is the bottom, do you trust God? Because he's just as trustworthy in that moment as when everything is lining up with your desires. Finally, do you trust God with your finances? See, this is, this is one of those areas that kind of we can stereotypically say is the last point of trust for most Christians. So do you trust the fact that, that God has the ability and desire to provide everything that you need? Do you trust the fact that everything you have came from God and is sustained by Him? And is that trust leading to obedience? And obedience looks like saying, hey, God, I'm gonna give 10% of my money back to you as a tithe, not because you need my money or the church needs my money, but because I need to learn to trust you better. And as you do that, you're saying, God, I trust in your ability to provide for me more than I trust in my ability to provide for me. So do you trust God, and is that trust leading to obedience? And not selectively, not saying, oh, well, I trust God over here, but not over here. Like, it, it wouldn't have been okay as we look through the life of Jesus to say, well, he trusted God, you know, with the teaching stuff, and he trusted God the Father over here, but he, when he came to the cross, he was like, nah, that's too far for me. No, he said he, he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So do you trust God, and is that leading to your obedience? Finally, as we wrap up in Philippians 2 here, we see that if we want to think like Jesus, we need to prioritize Jesus' glory. See, how Jesus lived with humility, with trust and obedience resulted in something. Verse 9, I'm going to read it again. It says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because of the life that Jesus lived, because of his humility, because of his trust in God's plan, he is the name that is to be worshiped. He is the name that is to be glorified and honored. And the implication of that is that we as his people are to glorify and honor the name of Jesus. And that is how we have been created as his people. And there's a statement from uh, an old book or an old document, and I'm not one for like old historical stuff. Like I don't spend my leisurely time reading books that are 350 years old. Um, but there's this one uh, from 1647, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It says this, it says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And I love this because it summarizes so much of what scripture teaches about our existence and our purpose and why we're actually here. Our purpose isn't to, to live this happy, healthy, you know, fun life where we achieve all of our dreams and goals as American citizens and everything's great. And after you know, the ripe old age of 98 or however long you wanna live, you go home and everything's great. But the purpose of life is to glorify God and find enjoyment in that. But we're so, we're so susceptible to wanting to glorify us Instead of building up Jesus' name, we want to build up our name. 
We want to build our reputation. We want to build our following. We want a lot of friends that think highly of us. Maybe not this group as much, but us younger folks, we want the social media following and platform. We want the, the career success. We want to amass enough money that we can do whatever we want, whenever we want. And none of those things are evil, but they all miss the point that we were created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And so, I want to challenge us tonight to, to be thinking, are we glorifying God with our life? And you, you might be thinking, okay, what's that look like? How, what are the steps we take to do it? What things do I need to do to do that? And 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So it's not just about, hey, what we do here at church or what we do when we're doing our, our Christian things, but literally, 1 Corinthians, like, you can glorify God in anything. Like, how you drink that bottle of water can be a way to glorify God. So, so with that, though, here's some, some maybe practical steps to evaluate, hey, where, where am I at with this? First, are, are you living with thankfulness to God? Are you looking for ways to say, hey, God, thank you for what you're doing in this area? Because as you do that, you're praising him and saying, hey, God, you have done this. I'm thanking you, I'm praising you for that. And I'm also saying, I didn't do this, you did. So are you living with, with thankfulness in your life? Second, are you growing with your godly character? See, our life as, as a Christian should be this constant upward trajectory of living more like the character of Jesus every day. And, and Jesus used this analogy of, of fruit. The idea being that a tree, a fruit tree, would demonstrate its health by the, the, the quality of the fruit that it produced. Like if you have an orange tree that doesn't produce oranges, it's a bad tree. And in the same way, as Christians, the fruit being the fruit of the Spirit, how are we living out the character of Jesus shows the health of our relationship. And Jesus said this in John 15, he says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So are you growing in your character? Finally, we glorify God by serving other people. This is the, the very nature of Jesus and as we live like him, we bring glory to him. And we believe that, that Christians should live with radical service to the world around us. That people would look at how we serve others and go, that doesn't make any sense except for the fact that we're living like Jesus. So today, understand that, that God's desire for you is for you to think, but then also act and live like Jesus. The way that we do that is by, by living with humility by trusting God's plan with our life and really prioritizing our life to be in a place where we're seeking God's glory. And thankfully, he doesn't assume that we're going to read his mind, but he's given us an abundance of instruction and teaching and guidance on this. And so dig into the book of Philippians or read the other epistles in the New Testament like Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. Those books are there to, to teach abundantly how to live like Jesus. And again, if you don't have a Bible, take one home with you. Read one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They're, they're biographies of Jesus, and it helps you get to know who is this Jesus and how do I live like him. Because God's desire for you is for you to, to think and to live like his son Jesus so that we can glorify him and enjoy him in our life. It's our hope and our prayer for you today. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you that you love us, that you gave your son to save us. And I just thank you for the fact that, that you have given us instruction, you have given us guidance on how you want us to live, on the decisions you want us to make, on the, the characteristics you want us to model. And God, we just want to admit here that, that living with humility is challenging, that trusting your plan is difficult, and that that walking in a way that brings glory to you instead of glory to us is not natural to us. So we pray that you, you change us, you help us to live more like your son Jesus so that we can better demonstrate that to the world around us.
and better connect to you as our Lord and our Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.